g'day. So this time, I'm going to look at something that is the law, because we've seen all these arrests occur in England in relation to everything that's going on around the whole planet. So I want to investigate some legal ramifications here and uh, demonstrate that a standing has already been defined that even the Supreme Court of New South Wales acknowledges as being real because the challenge here was being accused of a terrorist act just like all this stuff that you have seen in the riots in London is the same energy that New South Wales police used in the protests I guess Victorian police did the same thing at Victoria Markets and the Shrine of Remembrance in Melbourne. Tried to incite the violence so that they could come around with their abusive legislation and sweep you all up and put you away and silence you. Silence you when it can be demonstrated over time who the actual criminals are as we name them by name. Name them by name for their belligerence, for their acts of treachery to the Constitution, for, for their acts of treason to the, the very realm at which they operate in, at which they operate in by jurisdiction, by jurisdiction. So we're going to have a little look here at what this means, because you, you all want to believe this is some sort of, I don't know, it's not a TV show. This is some people working on your behalf, trying to demonstrate to you that we've already clarified this at law, while you continue to be egotistical heroes that don't want to believe and mock. And the Bible said very clearly that you would mock your own foundations believing in a foreign administration called the Australian government under some sort of foreign great seal of Australia. And we investigate this a, a little bit closer because I don't think you people fully comprehend that this is at law already on the Supreme Court of New South Wales. So what you all try to do in your protests and your ego online with your I'm better than everyone else and don't listen to him, he's a slander tart and all that sort of stuff, doesn't serve you any good. We're talking about the future of your country and the future of you as a society and our people that you fail to recognise while you're treated like wards of the state and manipulated into owning nothing. This is class warfare, class warfare where those super wealthy people want to keep you in this position. And we need to investigate that this has already been put on Supreme Court record and defined as a reality. Because if it wasn't real, it would have come up differently in these court matters. Now, I'm going to switch over to a microphone. This is a very difficult video to put together. So I'm going to just rely on microphone and some recordings and I'm going to put some pictures up on the screen. But this is something you need to listen to. This is something you need to comprehend. And I'm giving you the ability to share this video. Download this video and share it around. Because I think your ego's got in the way of the technical facets of what this actually means at law. So we're going to have a look at a court case that you can find on the internet. So if you go to caselawnewsouthwales.gov.au and look in the judicial decisions and type in the word Kiss Conan, this case will come up. So we're going to address a couple of sections in this court case to prove without a shadow of a doubt the reality that's on the table.
this is something that is confusing to some people. So we're going to discuss this as we read through it. 59. The first scenario was said to comprise the defendant continuing with the conduct of the kind engaged in prior to his arrest and incarceration. And the second, the risk of escalation of his conduct. So the court splits this up into a before and after scenario where the actions that were considered to be a threat by the New South Wales Police are weighed up with the continuing in those actions. Now, th these are the statements of a police officer, Matthew Reason, being adjudicated by Justice Lonergan and defined in their before and after statements. And we're going to have a look through here, uh, 59 through 70, in relation to this before and after. 60. It was explained that the first risk was the defendant's previous threats of hanging authority figures, including police, as threats of action that would fall within the definition of a terrorist act in section 100.12 of the code, but not SS3. These are threats of an action that would result in death and are threats made first with the intention of advancing a political or ideological cause and second with the intention of influencing the police or other public figures in the performance of their duties. It was argued that the defendant's continued adherence to these previously expressed beliefs indicates a real prospect of him resuming conduct of the kind engaged in prior to his arrest. And so there is a significant likelihood of the defendant engaging in conduct that constitutes a terrorist act being an offence contrary to section 101.1 of the code. So here Justice Lonergan sets out the police's defence as the plaintiff or person that applied to the court, the police have laid out what they believe to have taken place. Now, threats of violence were never made. Threats of hanging authority figures were never made. Warnings to authority figures were made given that their actions fell outside of the law therefore leading them to have participated in a criminal offence that could lead to a hanging uh, in The Hague. This is a very real prospect if you look at Slobodan Milosevic and the history in relation to his case. This makes all of the actors within this world system liable to those rules. And the police officer believes here that he is outside of those rules. He is the highest authority having the terrorist act in which to hold someone responsible for having a go at the government of the day. So we, we continue reading here, it will become uh, apparent what's going on. 61. The plaintiff accepted that the threats of violence are stated to only occur following the regime change for which the defendant advocates, but argued that this still satisfies the definition of terrorist act, and while the likelihood of threatened hangings might be low, 
And while the defendant may have had no intention to encourage immediate acts of violence, such threats are significant because they might create a milieu which fosters the prospect that personal injury will be suffered by innocent members of the community. Justice Lonergan puts the police on the back foot here by making them acknowledge themselves that no threats of violence had actually occurred. This is quite amusing given that the police continued in their efforts to define a terrorist act even though they accepted that no threat of violence or the incitement of violence had taken place, which means that the whole entire beginning of the police activities come into question. This is very evident by a very simple statement by Justice Lonergan, that they still attempt to treat it as a terrorist act for the sheer fact that this word milieu, it, it kind of defines the social environment in your own group, and they're trying to paint a tarred brush on the defendant for creating an environment in his social circles that would see members of the community harmed by his social circles, a milieu. So the police in this statement, Justice Lonergan's statement regarding the police here need, need to be scrutinised very, very hardly because th this is the police acting on their own whim and trying to use the legislation to achieve an objective rather than protect the community. 62. Alternatively, it was submitted that the defendant's conduct in publishing the videos on Facebook containing the material described above may lead to offences contrary to Section 101.5, collecting or making documents likely to facilitate a terrorist act or Section 101.6, doing any act in preparation for planning a terrorist act under the code, particularly as the defendant is only required to be reckless as to the connection between his conduct and a terrorist act in order to establish those offences. Now, rioting in the streets, like in London, brought on by a milieu surrounding Tommy Robinson might constitute that sort of definition. The videos that were posted on Facebook relating to preparing an Anzac memorial event are here constituted to be facilitating a terrorist act merely by raising a flag in remembrance of those Anzac, the flag that those Anzac flew into battle while standing on the holy ground of those Anzac war memorials, was deemed by the New South Wales Police to be collecting or making documents likely to faci facilitate a terrorist act. Preparation for planning a terrorist act under the military code, the codified law, codified. This recklessness as to his connection between his conduct of warning an acting agent of this government that he acts under certain rules that he was going outside of might be deemed to be reckless to who? And this becomes a question that Justice Lonergan begins to investigate. 63. The plaintiff argued 
that the connection between the videos of the kind made by the defendant and the commission of a terrorist act is a real one, given that those videos identify persons said by the defendant to be a legitimate target for retributive violence. This is interesting because this is the police using the state to try and get on the front foot when videos accused the state of making criminal offences that saw death penalty in relation to those offences. This is where Justice Lonergan defines this penalty at law in a later statement. But here we have the police attempting to call a legal argument a terrorist act when that legal argument was pointed at the very police themselves for their very own actions going outside of the rules they are obligated to follow. 64. Whilst there are disavowals of violence in the material, these disavowals occur alongside such statements as got to start carrying out action to deal swiftly with the foreign administrators ruling over a country with no rule of law. And I have now given you enough evidence evidence to crucify this man, and no one is truly prepared for what's coming. Intriguing that these statements were made going back to 2020, July 2021, in relation to statements that were made before July 2020, when the defendant was incarcerated. So these preparation of terrorist materials occurred before 2020 into 2019. So this statement becomes reasonably real post facto in that no one is truly prepared for what's coming in that this led to some criminal behaviour by the state in mandates and lockdowns. There are disavowals of violence in the material because the state was the one that had no rule of law and the evidence was on the table that they had pre-planned something that was heinous and going against the rules of administration that they're obligated to. This becomes a very interesting statement overall, given that you weren't truly prepared for what this government brought upon you with its international partners, its trade partners. And this is the unfortunate fact of the matter, in that warnings were given not only to the people, a milieu, warnings were given to the state and federal governments in relation to things that they seem to not care about and let ride anyway, without any forethought in the matter, demonstrating that some administrative power was just going to steamroll over them anyway. And here we are four, five years later, and what are the events that unfolded? 65. I interpolate here in regard to these statements that I do not see any of them as having sufficient clarity of proposed action to amount to a call to arms for violence. So Justice Lonergan interpolates 
So uh, as a third person looking into the argument, can't see the truth in the police's words, that therefore there is no fact of the matter coming from the New South Wales Police Force. There is no call to arms in respect of gathering people to attack anybody. The words were in relation to gathering the people to remember at a war memorial wherein the New South Wales police saw that as a terrorist act and attempted with the Terrorism Act's laws to attack that premise and are now on the back foot having been proven to be without fact. The judge is looking in as a third party and listening to both sides of the argument and looking at all the evidence on the table and defining the police's requests and the police's statements as being false. 66. Regarding the second risk scenario, the plaintiffs submitted that the risk assessment report author has concluded that the defendant is vulnerable to acting or engaging in violence to achieve the goals of the United Kingdom of Australia. If the narrative was to shift towards the people of Australia adopting roles within the kingdom that is creating perceived legitimacy for engaging in violence, warfare policing and or military jurisdiction. This statement on its own could be scrutinised over and over and dug into its varying different points. The second risk scenario is the post-fact scenario of continuing to act, whereas the judge has already proven without shadow of a doubt as a third party looking in that no actual criminal action had occurred in the initial arrest. We can see throughout the rest of the document that there are other things relative to his incarceration that don't add up to the initial attacks by police by attempting to frame this man as a terrorist, attempting to frame this man as a terrorist. Now, the police have paid some academic, a glass ceiling academic called the author of the risk assessment report, who has defined on behalf of the police that the defendant is a certain type of person. But what is very key here is that we're talking about a kingdom and violence in relation to warfare policing. And that is what the New South Wales police actually do because it involves military jurisdiction. It involves military jurisdiction. This is going to become evident as we look through this a little bit further. So the police are actually fearful here because the violence won't come from us. It will come from their commanding officers for them stepping outside of the rules inside that military jurisdiction. They had some sort of obligation at which the justice has defined to be not a terrorist act on our behalf and then a false act on the police's behalf while they are now trying to protect using some sort of academia their warfare policing their warfare policing. The police are the ones that are doing the policing under a military jurisdiction in an act of warfare 
under the Hague and Geneva Conventions. You only need to go and look at the Hague Conventions on the collection of debt. Sixty-seven. The plaintiff submits that this risk is unacceptable given that the defendant had previously made threats to police officers that may reasonably be interpreted as death threats. Justice Lonergan is pointing out the fear in the New South Wales police by defining a risk that is unacceptable to the police, given that threats that the police may be hung for their crimes were made. And this is the reality that's on the table. The laws weren't made by us. The laws were made by the people that command you. And that's the unfortunate reality when you go outside of the laws in your own command, in your own command. And the death threat would then come from your command because they're your laws. If the risk is unacceptable to you as a police officer, maybe you should resign. 68. His previous non-compliance with the CCO, which occurred back in May 2020, was premised upon his ideological beliefs. This is cited as evidence of risk, as is his reluctance to engage in mental health treatment. His criminal history involves some violence and some past difficulty with anger management based on information provided by his de facto partner, and these two are said to be matters that heighten risk. This is where you can see a nanny state in the police. His evidence of risk is his refusal to obey as a child what the nanny's advising him he needs to do. He's refusing to engage in a mental health treatment offered by the perpetrator, the oppressor. And knowing that that's the oppressor makes it even worse in that they're the ones offering the treatment to the ones that they mentally disturb in the very first place. This becomes very, very serious when they start using their computers to red flag you over all these little things that then become your history without actually being criminal in nature. Is past difficulty with anger management based on information provided by a third party, a third party who just blabbed away without any factual evidence, therefore that could not be used in evidence here of any violence. It's all hearsay. These are all said to be matters of heightened risk. Red flag, red flag, red flag, red flag. It's the Tourette's of the police department putting all your tiny little dirty things down on a computer system to tally them all up in a social experiment against you, therefore deeming you to be of heightened risk for your ideologies, your beliefs. Now, if those beliefs involve scripture and God, then this becomes even more serious in relation to the Constitution at section 116. This becomes the legal ramification of a belief system at which you're being attacked for believing in. This is evident of the police attacking a war memorial where a memorial parade was taking place. 69. It was submitted that the court should place weight on the conclusion by 
the risk assessment report author, that he is at moderate to high risk of engaging in politically motivated violence. We can't prove anything, so please listen to our third party that deemed him to be a risk to us, the police. We don't have any evidence that defines his actions to be anything against the law, so please listen to our glass-ceiling academic that can sign off in their academia that there is a heightened risk. Is that not a demonstration of bias being used in the courtroom by trying to get some sort of fake professional to put words down on a courtroom record in your defence, given that you have such a thin case, such a very tiny, thin case on which to base any of your claims, you actually need this fake report to go before the court at which you're expecting the judge to lean upon. Now, it should be pointed out to all of you that the police are risk-assessing you, the people. And there is an author to a report that did a risk assessment on a civilian in Australia. This risk assessment report was written on behalf of the police in defence of a court matter against a civilian, an individual. This means that the police have a system of mechanics to be able to do these sorts of reports on every single Australian that they deem to be a risk to their ideology of military policing. Now, we're just going to jump forward to 83, where we start to see how this all compounds together and this belief that the police have where their standing has been questioned and accusations that they break the law themselves being put on the table. We can see here that an attack by the police themselves is a precursor to them attempting to stop or sweep under the table any obligations that they may have that were put on the table. And this includes going outside of treaties, conventions, and obligations that that they are put under in their duty as a police officer. 83. Fifth, there was nothing in the risk assessment report of Miss Prince which could comprise an assessment result of relevance to terrorist behaviour. We, we can see how this is just an attempt by the police to tar and feather and has failed miserably in respect to the United Kingdom of Australia and its sovereign beliefs that are then tarred with this brush of sovereign citizen beliefs, wherein it's very clear here that Justice Lonergan has recognised no terrorist attempt was taken place. This is very evident when you are at a war memorial and then discussing administration by an organisation in which the police are directly connected to and involved with, that the police are in their own attempt trying to deflect from those people making that standing and, and that standing seems to come with a whole plethora of rules that are on the table internationally that deem these officers to have committed an offence going against rules that have been codified into the Criminal Code 1995. 
There is no need to take an officer to The Hague when The Hague has been codified locally. This puts all of the officers across the continent in the same responsibility, in a recognition here of the statements that have been put on the table by Justice Lonergan. You can see that there is quite a chunk that Justice Lonergan has taken out of this report by Miss Prince, where Justice Lonergan's own words state that there is nothing in the report that would constitute anything that the police are making statement of. Just to be clear, reading the words in the report, and for the judge, Justice Lonergan, to find nothing in the report, while at the same time printing words from the report, is a way of Justice Lonergan saying there is nothing wrong with the actions described in those words. 84. At its highest, the conclusions in these paragraphs amount to speculation that the environment or the narrative could change to be interpreted by others as a call to arms. There is nothing relevant to activity in custody and nothing that indicates information that any of the defendant's current or former associates are known to be included in terrorism activities. At its highest, let's be clear here, at its highest, what is that highest point at law? The conclusions in these paragraphs, okay, do not amount to or can't be interpreted as a call to arms. Why? At its highest, you would be returning home wherein they are the administrator. You have the right of self-determination within that international law. You have a right to return back to where you came from in that law at its highest. It can't be defined as a terrorist activity for returning to who you are as a people in line of authority to your constitution, which they administer at its highest. This is where Justice Lonergan is pointing out that she is aware of rules that go above the statute, that go above the common laws that are in play across the internal national boundary of the Commonwealth of Australia. But when you have a foreign executive branch managing that constitution, this brings into play a set of rules that most people aren't aware are actually in play at its highest. So we can be confident here that Justice Lonergan, as in the footsteps of the Brereton Report under Justice Brereton, is also aware of those higher rules. 86. There is no evidence that the defendant intended to cause physical harm to any person or endanger lives by his actions. The calling for the curial overthrow of the government does not amount to a terrorist act or a calling for curial punishment. The court should view any statement that a person or class of persons will be punished in a particular way, even by capital punishment, when the law is changed. Is quintessentially political advocacy, no matter how offensive or uncomfortable those threatened by it might find it. This is by far the most important statement at law by any 
judicial procedure in any country around the world, and most people aren't even aware of the fact that it's actually been stated on a courtroom record. There is no evidence that the defendant intended to cause physical harm to any person or endanger lives by his actions. The actions were the attendance at a war memorial to consecrate a flag in memorial of those that are in the lineage before us. We are raising a flag for our ancestors. We are raising a flag at a war memorial that defines those ancestors' names. We have attributed those ancestors' to that flag and a line of authority in an estate that is managed. There is no evidence at all in relation to harm or endangering the lives of what we would call the community. The calling for the curial overthrow, crown, curial, crown, Right, a crown occupying and administering a crown position, the executive level, the executive branches of this government through Letters Patent 1900, overwritten by Letters Patent 1984, leading to the Australia Act 1986. The crown calling for the removal of this executive branch does not amount to a terrorist act or calling for their curial punishment or calling for them to adhere by the rules that they brought here under the Hague and the Geneva Conventions. The court should view any statement that a person or class of persons, is that the middle class? The working class, the poor, is that the bureaucratic class, Clive Palmer, and that other jab of the hut, is is that the class of persons that will be punished in any particular way? Are are we going to persecute the middle class or the poor or the bureaucratic class? There is... No statement in relation to the punishment of a class, even by capital punishment when the law is changed. So Justice Lonergan here is referring to two sets of laws here, curial punishment and capital punishment. And capital punishment is where the hanging of a man or the execution of a man after a court case is not lawful in Australia. We do not go through capital punishment in Australia, but that doesn't excuse agents of an administrative power under some sort of curial arrangement from being obligated to some sort of curial punishment, i.e. the Hague, i.e. the International Criminal Court of Justice, like the leader of Israel right now. Is very important because now we're talking about the difference between national capital and international curial, calling for the international overthrow of the government does not amount to a terrorist act, calling for the removal of what is foreign in a crown from your kingdom does not amount to a terrorist act is quintessentially political advocacy, no matter how offensive or uncomfortable those threatened by it might find it. And this is where the police in New South Wales were warned and informed very clearly that they would be breaking these rules and they found it uncomfortable enough to attack in a preemptive strike in a bid to turn this into terrorism when they are technically the liable party under the set of rules. And this is being pointed out very clearly that 
no matter how offensive or uncomfortable those threatened by it might find it. So Matthew Reason of Fixated Persons Unit New South Wales State Protection Squad is the one that organised all state police forces to go on the offensive against something that was deemed to be lawful in its action in a curial matter, putting these rules on the table and Matthew Reason himself at threat of those rules for going outside of those rules in this very attack. We could now look at the actions of Anthony Albanese and the referendum that came out of these executive branches of government that sought to undermine the line of authority that is you, the people, in the Constitution. As an administering power, Anthony Albanese sought to dismantle the very line of authority that existed in this Constitution, at which he's not the first to attempt to do so. There has been a slow degradation of the values in the very contract that it is as a constitution in a line of authority under the blessing of Almighty God. And the failure of Albanese in relation to this referendum could be seen as a direct act of treason to the constitution and the realm itself under King Veer Casement 1917, wherein Anthony Albanese did try to replace the blessing of Almighty God, going against section 116 of the very constitution in which he acts. These very actions sought to undermine the very office of Prime Minister in which he sits. To undermine your very own office at law by removing the line of authority in that office is an act of treason is an act of treason of the highest order. This is attempting to dismantle the very foundational document that makes you a people, a country, a country. And Anthony Albanese sought with the likes of Lydia and the Greens to undermine that very core foundation that makes you the Commonwealth of Australia. To do anything in relation of, to changing the Constitution into a republic is undermining the very office in which you sit. And this applies to every senator, every House of Representatives, and every executive officer operating within the boundaries of that Constitution. To dismantle the constitution that gives you a line of authority to sit in office is an act of treason. 87. The court could find that what the defendant is advocating is not conduct in support of violent actions, but rather application of what he believes might be the result of due process of law, and so it is in effect an extreme political view advocating political change as opposed to an extremist view advocating illegal violence. Extreme versus extremist. Extremist. Left wing right-wing extremists. When you speak for a different bird, curial, a different crown, the idea might be an extreme idea, but to look at it from a legal standpoint could actually be the due process of law. This extreme want for a political change doesn't equate to the left or the right. 
It equates to the removal from an executive branch of government, something that is very criminal and very corrupt. And the due process of law that we speak of could see them before places like The Hague. 88. The court should take at face value the videos and statements within them that are careful not to invoke extracurial violence. Extracurial violence. By telling listeners to be careful of what he had seen to be the operation of law once the matter was before the Hague. He also admonishes people who might attend that they must not be violent. In effect, what the defendant is advocating is for people to assert their rights, but if you are forced to, go peacefully and keep a diary of the interaction. Is this Justice Lonergan confirming that you have a right that you could assert and that you are being advocated to assert it and then warning you that if you are forced by someone like a New South Wales police officer, go peacefully and keep a diary of this crime that may have occurred. Keep a diary of this crime that may have occurred. There is also this before the Hague in inverted commas. Now, we point out to you that in Volume 2 of the Criminal Code 1995, you will find all of those rules making these police officers as well as every agent of the government, doesn't matter what department you work in, you are linked to these rules. And these rules are covered by things like Accountability Act 2013, which sort of, at a statutory level, limits you from breaking international law while working for a body that is technically the administrator of a constitution that has committed an international offence by trying to undermine the rights of a people that own and are the line of authority into that constitution. So at law, the judge is warning you very clearly that you have a right to assert, but also warning you very clearly to go peacefully if you are inhibited from carrying out your rights. Now I'm just going to jump to the end of the document and just see some of the closing remarks from Justice Lonergan. 125. There are multiple layers of speculation involved in the material upon which the plaintiff relies to reach the proposed conclusion as to the defendant's relevant risk. The New South Wales police are telling the biggest porky pie lies that they could possibly try and attempt to tell, and the justice is calling it speculation, because none of it is based on fact, and there might actually be an inherent lack of knowledge on the police officer's behalf, and the judge may also be alluding to that fact, that the police officer just doesn't know enough to be able to make a challenging argument in respect of the actions that had taken place. This also puts a police officer on the back foot because the rules at which he is obligated to engage in his duty have seen him commit an offence by attacking a people while remembering their dead at a technical war memorial. This, in effect, is an international offence within the rules that we speak of. 
So by attacking a people, organizing an event at a war memorial in remembrance of the dead defined by that war memorial is in fact an offence at law committed by a police officer that sought to gather the troops of all the states and effect an attack across more than all the capital cities in the country. One, two, six. I also doubt that the type of activities the defendant might engage in, even if he was still a believer, would, properly considered, amount to a serious terrorism offence. Again, we have a Justice of the Supreme Court acknowledging the beliefs of a crown and kingdom as being occupied and administered. And therefore, if you were still to believe that this was an administering power that had no right or line of authority in the Constitution, that, that would not constitute a terrorism offence because you are in fact in full defence of the Constitution itself. You would have to go about attacking the Constitution to be deemed to be some sort of terrorism against the federal bodies of administration here. But pointing out that they're the ones that have gone outside of the rules and, there should, and therefore should be liable to those rules is deemed as a threat by this state protection squad, i.e. fixated persons, and therefore needed to be attacked to stop it from pointing out that the police were in fact the ones committing the offences. And this goes to before the arrest, in, in that the police were sent documentation in relation to the offences that they have been committing and therefore would be at risk of committing more offences too, and instead of adhering to those laws that are on the table, chose to go outside of those laws and act like they didn't exist and are now technically on the back foot because the judge has confirmed the belief in a kingdom to be true and real and the belief that you have a curial right to return and remove what is a foreign executive branch from your constitution, we can see that the judge has rounded out at the end of this document defining the United Kingdom of Australia to be a non-terrorist organisation because it is actually the de jure that sits under what is being administered by a foreign executive branch of government that just tried to undermine and remove you from your very own constitution. Okay, so we had a look at the court, the Supreme Court of New South Wales, and we looked at a judge's words in relation to the New South Wales police inside the state of New South Wales. We see that a justice defines some sort of curial right in the matter, but defines this exclusion from violence because there is a knowledge of some higher rules that are laid out on the table. Now, having a curial power must come from somewhere. And this right defined is a knowledge. It's a knowledge that you've been kept in the dark from in some sort of mini modern dark age pushed on you by the people that pushed the dark ages on everyone in the early part of our history. That uh, Roman Catholic papist sort of line of authority that might have committed some heinous criminal behaviour across the world, across the entire world. 
So let's look at a line of authority that becomes the blessing of Almighty God defined in the uh, Constitution Act uh, under the blessing of Almighty God defines some sort of line of authority into a kingdom that might have come under administration. Revelation 6, Authorised King James Version And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth, to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, O holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also, and their brethren that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. And I beheld, when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll, when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? We can see through a knowledge of history that brought forward a flag in the lineage and ancestry that was afforded to us by our forefathers that has brought a severe fear to the state as its state protection squad sought to undermine the very premise of 
that blessing in Almighty God. And it can be demonstrated here that the comprehension of six seals and knowing what they mean and how they bring heaven and earth together demonstrates to a judge that a knowledge of not only the history of this country but the forming of a foundation through the scripture to be able to hold that blessing, to be able to stand up to what is a curial power that came here to nanny you for your debts. And that's not to say that the curial power in administration is the problem. There are creditors through the IMF and the Reserve Bank that cause a massive problem in the privatisation of public industry all across the country. You used to own your electricity grids. You used to own your own railways. These things have all been privatised into the hands of investors through this corruption that goes on inside the executive branches of this government. They are administering you out of everything and trying to undermine you from what is yours by teaching you less and less and less so you become dumber and dumber and dumber to it and then in the long run forget of your own volition. And what the judge here has defined is an understanding and an acceptance that what has been put on the table is actually true and real. There is no terrorism act when a people return back to what is technically theirs while it is administered by foreign executive branch nannies. Once the sun grows up to recognise a nanny is in the house and that nanny has her hand in the biscuit tin, only one thing could be said for the nanny. She is corrupt in father's affairs and the son has woken up to that corruption. Okay, I'm glad you made it to the end. That was a pretty long exhaustion of brain exercising law to go through. But it clearly demonstrates the standing that I put down on the table that has been mocked time and time and time again while you all fall into the American pseudo-legal garbage that this cretin Matthew Reason actually defines in his statement on the court record in this court case. So, it's a difficult thing to swallow, but we start to see what Justice Lonergan has laid out. And then when you add together the Burton report, and the culpability of soldiers in the field, there's one big difference between a soldier and a police officer here. A soldier is given a card which defines his rules of engagement that limit his engagement while on assignment. Now, the police, while under oath and a duty to some bastardised crown, have an oath to protect the community, but instead use the statutory law to protect themselves. It's their kind of rules of engagement given to them by the parliament. And their lack of understanding of those real rules of engagement that a soldier knows puts them in a serious consequence when they break those rules by attacking someone on a war memorial, for instance, which is a right, a self-determinable right in international law, wherein they're supposed to protect those flexing that right, but instead chose to attack, which became a criminal offence enacted by the State Protection Squad of New South Wales government. New South Wales government that creates all the statutory law to limit these police officers in the field. 
So we have this conundrum that a judge has recognised a standing defined in the lineage of your forefathers and defined your right to flex that right and then also defined documenting when the police and the state refuse you your rights to do the things you have a right to. This is a very stark re revelation. Revelation 6 in undoing six seals that lead up to a seventh seal and some trumpets being blasted around. These are real things that have already been done at law and my advice to all of you scrambling to get out of a fine etc is to finally listen. And my advice to you that are protecting the state while they commit these serious and heinous criminal offences is to look at what has technically been laid out on the table to be a fact in the matter and look at your actions in your job working for a government under some executive branch control whether you yourself are committing an offence. And this is where the Bible tells you to do the very minimal amount of work that you're required to do while you're in your job working for that machine. Because that machine is an evil monster compounded in evil rules that you're starting to see unfold on an international stage in relation to Israel and Net and Yahoo. It's very serious consequences for people that have enacted within a rule set and then refused to acknowledge that they're actors in that rule set and now the warning has been clearly put on the table that you are actors in an administration that have gone outside of the rules of administration therefore committing administrative fraud and even worse war crimes war crimes against a entire population which is inhumane according to those rule sets that were put down on the table right so that that would be a war crime that would be a crime against humanity that would be a crime against mankind this is flexing a power that they don't have in the fear that a true power is coming up underneath them to hold them to account to a set of rules that they should have been aware of after a certain criminal trial in 1946. So as we sign off, I'll put some bank account details up again. Thank you for your donations. You start to see that this is very credible thing at law being defined on the Supreme Court record. Share this video out try and get as many people to listen to it as you possibly can because this involves very technically in a supreme court that can be held up in the high court that members of this government and pauline i know you're totally aware of them have committed serious international criminal offenses while acting in office of administration and it's now cleanup time the wokeness has come to an end because the wokeness drove all the fools to break the laws and now the law will come and clean up everything that was woke. So in closing, these are your rights to assert, not protest, not riot, not fuck around like what you're seeing and have seen. It's now time to look at financially, lawfully, and defence-wise, what you as a people, a country, have a right to do against what is an administration that is changing hands from some Zionist sort of agenda into some sort of socialist, communist agenda right now, while you all sit on your hands not flexing that right, flexing that right to not be managed by this executive branch 
and take command and control of your own affairs as a people, as a country, from what you're internationally bound in that is going outside of those rules and committing all sorts of weird crimes while attempting to scramble into some sort of monetary, financial, logistical control when underneath it all, they technically don't have a right. They gain their right from you all sitting on your hands like children. And it's now for you to realize that acting like grown-ups might mean not fighting them and getting on with it so that you can remove them from your country, remove them from the executive branches that keep manipulating your constitution going back as far as 1939. So, in closing, it is emphatically stated that these are your rights that you can flex. It's up to you as a people, not individuals, to go and flex those rights and accuse these people of the crimes that they have indeed committed. So I'll sign off. Again, glad you made it to the end. Au revoir.